Welcome everyone to the Workers' Compensation Claims for Remote Workers web webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us. Today's presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available within Academy within two business days. As you have questions, you may post them in the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will answer a few questions during the presentation and we will answer the rest of the questions at the end of the call. We will try our best to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation, but if for whatever reason we are unable to get to your question today, please email learning at nfp.com. At this time, I'll hand the call over to Jeff Stagg, Senior Vice President, National Claims Practice Leader at NFP. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amber, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, again, my name is Jeff Stagg. I will be your host, and I'm NFP's National Claims Practice Leader. Assisting me today is uh, Gail Hamilton, Vice President, Claim Account Executive for NFP. Uh, this seminar, the topic, uh, as Amber mentioned, is how to control New York workers' compensation claims for remote workers. The discussion points that we're gonna be focused on, number one, COVID-19 versus remote workers, two, guidelines for remote workers, and three, what case law can be used in defending remote workers' compensation claims. We would like this seminar to be interactive, so please use your question and answer box at the bottom of the screen, and please ask a lot of questions. We would now like to in introduce Michael Vecchione, managing partner of Vecchione, Vecchione, Connors & Cano, to begin our discussion. Michael? Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. I hope everybody's doing well today. Before I get started with the presentation, I would like to take a minute to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day in order to participate in the presentation. I also like to thank, thank the wonderful people from NFP, Jeff, Dale, and Amber for setting up the presentation. The content is mine, but all the wonderful artwork of the presentation was provided by the people at NFP. As Jeff stated, this presentation will be twofold, um, how to control New York workers' compensation claims for remote workers, but also COVID-19. And the two are interactive because remote workers' claims, uh, remote workers are always around. We have case law going back 50 years on remote workers, but due to COVID-19, the amount of the workforce working remotely has increased dramatically. Our firm alone went from five to 10% remote workers to about 40 to 45%. And I don't think we'll ever go back. So remote workers are increasing and that will cause their claims to increase. So that's why we decided to present this presentation. It's a very important topic for all of you. Jeff, if you go to the next slide, please. Remote workers are not a new phenomenon, but COVID-19 has significantly increased the number of workers working remotely. Existing case law is a guide defending claims of remote workers. As I stated, I will present to you today some um, claims case law that has been around for about 50 years. So we had a, a lot of case law to guide us. An accident home is similar to an unwitnessed accident on the employer's premises. Actually, it's even worse. When you have an accident on your premises that is unwitnessed, it's hard to rebut the testimony given by the injured worker in court, but you might have somebody who arrived at the scene of the accident immediately thereafter. You might have a video camera on your premises. You also know that the worker was working that day. With remote workers, the ability to go between personal and work tasks is so easy that it's hard to defend these claims, but we're gonna map out a strategy for you today to defend these claims. Jeff, if you go to the next slide, please. To be compensable under the workers' compensation law, an accidental injury must arise both out of and in the course of a claimant's employment. And what does that mean? If somebody's simply at work and they have a heart attack, because they're at work doesn't necessarily mean that the heart attack is related. Something about work had to contribute to the beginning of the heart attack. 
if it just happened because of underlying coronary artery disease leading to an occlusion of an artery and work did not play any part of it, even though they're at work, it did not play a part in the heart attack and it's not compensable. It's the same thing for remote workers. If something happens in their house, their house is not their work environment. Typically when they're working remotely, their work environment is limited to a desk or an office within their house. So we have to differentiate between what's the work environment at home and what's the personal environment. There is no requirement that the underlying activity be done at the employer's direction or directly benefit the employer. For example, if the employer does not direct the worker to order something, but they want to order something for their desk because they want to have a new pencil holder or a new placemat on their desk, it doesn't really benefit the employer. It doesn't add to their work. It also the employer didn't direct them to get it. But case law will establish that they, if they ordered that, and it is for their work, that it would be a compensable accident. For example, if they ordered it and Amazon delivers it, and they run downstairs to get the delivery, going away from their work desk, downstairs to pick up a package could be considered a compensable accident. So we have to be very careful about differentiating what's a personal activity at home and what isn't. Also short breaks, if somebody's at work on your premises and they go to the bathroom or it's a paid lunch break, or if they get a cup of coffee, all of that is compensable. And it's the same at home. So if they tell you, I went to grab a cup of coffee, tripped and fell, that would be a compensable accident because it's a short deviation from employment. So at home, you might think that's a personal activity where at work you would understand it isn't but those are compensable accidents. So we have to differentiate between grabbing a cup of coffee to have at your desk, or maybe taking dinner out of the oven for the family um, that night. That would be a personal activity. So we really have to drill down into what they were doing at the time the injury occurred. Jeff, next slide, please. Matter of Caprera sets forth the standard to determine the compensability of remote workers' claims. In this case, the worker purchased a new desk. Now, the employer did not direct the worker to purchase a desk. In fact, they said they did not want to purchase the desk for the worker. But the worker spent their own money, purchased the desk, and while assembling it and carrying it to the work location, the worker was injured. Initially, the judge in the Workers' Compensation Board said since the employer did not authorize the purchase of the desk or pay for it, it was not compensable. The appellate division overturned, saying that since it was a work activity and the desk was for work, that it was compensable. So it's very important that before an accident, and that's what we're going to get into, to defend these claims, what you should do before the accident happens and what you should do after the accident happens, that's very important. But part of it is strictly controlling what activities are performed. And if you are going to authorize the purchase of a new desk, it's very important that you have somebody other than the worker set it up. Somebody who is a desk worker, um, if you allow them to do heavy carrying and assemble a desk or carry equipment, it probably could lead to an accident because they're not used to that activity. At least most of us are not used to that activity. So I highly recommend setting up the home office. It's very important that I would hire a vendor to do any assembly or installation of equipment. Uh, Jeff, the next slide, please. Employees who work from home outside the direct physical control of their employers are potentially able to alternate between work-related and personal activities when they choose. For this reason, injuries sustained from employees working from home should only be found to be compensable when they occur during the employee's regular work hours and while the employee is actually performing their employment duties or on a short break. Now, it's very important to lay out the hours that they're working and their duties. This is something that you should work out before time. And you could also work with NFP or our firm 
um, to help you set up a program where you can put in place and have actually have them sign off on so that they know what their work hours are and when they should be working. Next slide, Jeff. The home office exception was first set forth in Hilly over 50 years ago. While it is established in New York workers' compensation law that injuries which occur at home may be deemed work-related and compensable, appellate division decisions and recent decisions of the board demonstrate that the facts and circumstances of such claims will carefully be scrutinized. In recognition of the work-related and personal tasks that can take place in someone's home, the issue of whether an injury arises while the employee is actually performing work-related duties at the time of an injury occurs will frequently return on the facts and circumstances involved. The next slide, Jeff. Now, this is an important slide, and I'm going to slow down a little bit on this slide because this is really the important part of the presentation. What should you do before the accident happens, and what should you do after the accident happens? What you do before it in setting up your program um, for at home and having the worker and the employer sign off on it is just as important as the investigation you do afterwards, because the only way we could disprove a remote worker claim is to have a policy in place of what is work at home and then a quick investigation afterwards. If you don't have both, it'll be hard to disallow these claims. And then what are you falling into? A 24 seven coverage of whatever they do at home that could be considered work. So investigation into claims of remote work is a difficult but not impossible. The record must be developed to determine exactly what the claimant was doing at the time of the accident and where they were. So what the investigation, what will help if you, what would you want to do before the investigation to help with the investigation? I'll give you some examples of what our firm does. And we have 25 attorneys doing just representing employers in New York State and 80 people. So our firm is not tiny, but it's certainly not a large business. So the things that I'm going to tell you to do are not overly expensive because we were able to afford them. The first thing is clocking in and out. Most everybody has a smartphone today and most companies have a payroll company. So right on your phones, we have a process where they have to clock in and out on their phone. So our payroll company tracks their time. So the first thing you wanna do if possible is have that sort of device in play because then when they tell you what time they got hurt or if they go to the emergency room and it documents when the injury occurred, you could then see if they were working at the time of the injury by seeing if they were clocked in. That'll be strong evidence before a work of compensation law judge. We also have software that monitors when people are working on their computers. And why I concentrate on computers is there may be other types of remote workers, but today most of the cases we get, remote workers are working home on their computers. So we have software that monitors the activity on a computer. So now we can cross check the work on the computer when they are posting in and out and see if it matches up with the time of the accident. And if not, we could present to the judge in developing our case that when they said they were injured, they were both clocked out and their computer was not active. As far as an investigation, Afterwards, it's very, very important to get an investigator to the scene as soon as possible. As soon as the injured workers obtain legal representation, I can tell you, one, they won't talk to you. Their lawyers um, prohibit it. Two, their lawyers will give them a script. I mean, they won't tell them the lie. But what they'll tell them is if you were hurt in your kitchen making dinner, the accident's not compensable. But if you were hurt near your desk, and you hurt your whole body, I can get you $200,000. So where were you hurt? They don't tell them the lie, but I could tell you, especially with the COVID cases, the script of the testimony of each individual was so exact that it was obvious that the lawyers were scripting it for them. They were telling all 
the COVID claimants that they should say they never left their house ever except to go to work, that they never filled their car up with gas, but somehow was able to get back and forth to work. So once they lawyer up, it's really hard to investigate a claim. So I would strongly recommend if you have the ability, as soon as you receive notice of a claim, a statement should be taken from the injured worker. They should go to the, the household or the remote workplace. They should walk them through how they were injured to see if the mechanism of injury matches up with what they're saying. We could then get an IME to see if the injury could have been occurred by that activity. So before time, you really should be documenting the work hours. You should be documenting what their work duties are. You should try to go to the premises and map out the premises, look to see if there are any hazards in the premises near their work environment that could possibly cause an injury. You should have them sign off on their work hours, their duties, where their, their workstation is, their office. That's all very important. And then the investigator should document afterwards that they were doing work activity and it happened at their desk. If it all lines up, we are responsible for the claim, but we want to make sure we're not responsible for claims that were occur during personal activity. Hello, Step Mike. It's, hello, Go Mike. It's, it's Jeff. There's a, a question that has been posed and I, f I figured, let me ask you it. Does Absolutely. The, does the employer need to advise the employee that they're monitoring the employee's computer time? Um, we have let our employees know that's outside of the workers' compensation jurisdiction, but we asked the lawyer and he told us no. So, but we did anyway. I mean, they obviously know they're clocking in and out because they have to do it on their smart, uh, smartphone. And we let everybody know that there's software. So we did it to be totally transparent. Um, but we asked a lawyer whose field that is, and he told us that you did not have to let them know that you were monitoring their computer. Thank you, Michael. You're absolutely welcome. Establish whether the activity that caused the injury was work-related or personal, Find out exactly what they were doing when they were injured. If it has something to do with getting food, was it food to eat during the day, the work day, or were they preparing food for someone else? So it's important to do that. It is important for employers to develop clearly defined work hours, but possible clocking in and out for breaks, clearly defined employment duties while working from home, and documentation of what items such as computers or furniture will be covered by the employer all of this should be put into writing, signed off by the worker, signed off by the manager of the worker. Employers should consider providing assembly and setup of any home office items supplied or directed by the employer. And referring back to the case of Caprano, you don't want to have somebody who's not able carrying a heavy desk and setting it up, doing activities outside the work activities. It could lead to injuries that you'll be responsible for. Next slide, please. As soon as the employer receives notice of an accident, the injured worker should be asked to provide a detailed written history of the incident, including the time, place, and circumstances surrounding the incident. So the event is well documented to allow the proper review by the Workers' Compensation Board for compensability. Now, I just want to highlight in stress, we, you know, 25 lawyers just defending uh, employers and workers' compensation in New York State, we handle a volume of employers in the state. And I can tell you that, you know, you might say, oh, this is good ideas, but we're not going to do it. I want to stress that I see that the employers that implement these procedures, implement quick investigations, their cost, their overall cost of workers' compensation claims is much less than the employers we represent who don't put these in place. So I, I strongly recommend working with NFP and working with us to try to implement these. We'd be glad to help you just as a courtesy because the employers who do this and take these steps do save money. And also when you go to get insurance, um, we'll speak about that also, when the underwriter sees that you have a good program in place, you'll get cheaper insurance. Next Mike, slide, we have, please. We have a go question ahead. The scenario. Um, so there's, there's a question in the chat asking, so an employee says they are injured after at the near the end of their work day. Uh, let's suppose that they state that their work phone rang and they were um, they were rushing to go pick it up at the end of a work day. Would that be considered a compensable claim? 
if, if they were clocked out, well, at the end of their workday, if they were doing it, do you mean after the conclusion of their workday? Let's say after the conclusion of the, they work nine to five, the phone rings 515, they run to go pick up the phone and they're injured in the midst of trying to get it before it goes to voice. If, if, if they testify that um, their manager or a client or a customer or somebody called and they were attending to that, that probably would be compensable. Now that you can check. Um, you could get their phone records, you could see who called at the time of the accident, and then you could trace that number back um, to the client. If it was a client and they were attending to a client or their boss, it would be considered compensable. Now, I have other information that help you also. IP addresses. If you don't know what an IP address is, when somebody works from home, they have an IP address for their internet. Most computers use internet if not all. That's good. Our security will tell us when somebody's trying to get in on an unknown internet. Our security system documents every IP address that comes into our system. If we see a foreign IP address coming in, it sends up a warning and we could trace that. Why is that important? Well, one, having nothing to do with workers' comp for security and to secure your system. But you could tell where your workers are working. One of them popped up recently and it was from Florida. We traced it, it was an unknown IP address. We traced it, it was from Florida and we found out it was one of our workers. So it was one of our attorneys, Heather, and I called her up, I'm like, where are you? She's like, uh, I went to visit my parents in Florida. I'm working from oh. Florida. Fine, we don't mind you working for Florida, but that opens us up to possible yes. exposure in Florida that you need to know about. So we're going to get into that also, but it's important to know where your workers are. That's a big phenomenon that we will get into, but that's another place where you can track where somebody is. If they're on a computer and they're not in their home, you know, maybe they were deviating from employment or maybe they weren't working at the time. So that's important to know if it's outside of their work office, that could be more proof that it's not a compensable claim, that then it was not during their working hours or while they were working. So that's another way that you can put in place to try to track your workers to see if the injury is compensable. Next well, slide. Well, just, just okay. kind of backing on that last part that you said. So if an employee is working, they're supposed to be working remotely from home and say they do, so they do kind of pick up and go visit mother, whoever, their relatives. If they were injured in that other location that was not pre-authorized, is, would that be considered compensable if they were injured someplace other than where the, the actual management has authorized them to work out of? See, and, and that's, that's a fantastic question, whoever answered it, because it's important. If you follow these steps and put in place that your work area is your address, your home, and it's strictly forbidden for you to work elsewhere without permission from the employer, and you enforce that policy, there's a good chance you could win that claim. I wouldn't guarantee it, but that would be a deviation from employment. And if you have, you know, a program in place, which signed off by the claimant and they left, that could be a, a claim that you could win. Yes. Great. But you got to, one, have the policy in place, signed off by the injured worker and enforce that policy that they're not allowed to work anywhere else without permission. And I got to tell you, a lot of our clients have that in place. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Next slide, Jeff. Generally, carriers view a virtual workforce as less risky than being in the office. However, underwriters will look for the employer to have a formal virtual workforce program in place that addresses overall safety and ergonomics. If the employer of virtual employees can demonstrate that they have a solid program in place, the carrier's underwriter would view that as favorable in their evaluation of the risk presented by that employer. Now, I, I do want to make you feel good. We handle many hundreds, if not thousands of claims. And I could tell you the incidence of remote workers' claims is low. It could increase due to the new phenomenon caused by COVID where a lot more people are working from home. But the good thing is, one, the Workers' Comp Board scrutinizes remote worker injuries because there's just so easy to tie a claim into work when it was personal. 
And two, less accidents happen in the home environment than in the work environment. So that's also a plus for you. You know, I wouldn't stray away from remote workers because it's hard to investigate claims because there are very limited amount of claims for remote workers compared to the construction industry or other heavy duty industries. So that's, that's good for remote workers. Next slide, please. Employers can reduce the potential for work-related injuries for a remote workforce, establish a clear telecommuting policy, which establishes a designated work area, proper workstation, ergonomics, the hours of work, including break times, and the general workflow process. The policy should also include either a home inspection or at a minimum, a survey to address any rule out of hazards. All remote workers and their managers should sign off on the telecommuting agreement, and there should be regular compliance checkpoints to assure that the policy is being followed. The manager should communicate frequently to assure well being and to keep the worker connected to the workplace. I'd like to stress that enforcing these policies that you put in place is very important. When we go before the judge, if we can show strict enforcement, we could usually win a case using your program. If the worker can show that you really didn't enforce the program, and in fact, you let them travel, let them go uh, work at other states or other places, then the judge won't really use your policy to disallow an accident. So if you're going to put the policy in place, it's very important to follow up on it and to enforce it. Next slide, Jeff. The burden of proof is on the remote worker to establish their injury occurred in and out of the course of employment before it will be deemed compensable. What does that mean? The worker must prove that an accident occurred and that it occurred in and out of the course of employment. That is simplistic for the worker to do. They just have to testify to something that I was at my desk, I was working on my computer, I turned and got up to get paper uh, from the side of my desk, twisted my knee and injured my knee. Something as simple as that, they've met this burden. Once they meet this burden, the burden falls on the employer and your defense counsel to rebut the presumption that it's a compensable claim. And to do it with a remote worker, since we don't have video of the workplace, since we don't have a witness, we are greatly constrained on what we have available to us. You have to use these tools that we're talking about, you know, to defend against the claim, prove that they weren't clocked in, they weren't on their computer, they were at a different IP address, or, you know, it, the mechanism of accident couldn't have happened. And you can only do that by having these programs in place before and having an investigation afterwards to make sure everything lines up and they were heard at home and the way they said they were heard. Also, in your investigation, one of the most important things, in addition to getting that quick statement and getting that quick investigation of the work accident location, is the medical records. We win more claims at the medical records. And I'm not talking after they get to the doctor that their attorney referred to them, because then everything, the attorney and the doctor, well, they work together they will make sure that the story is put in writing. But the initial records, when somebody goes to an emergency room, that is about the truthful statement you'll ever get, especially when they're in pain and they're, they're worried about their you know, physical well-being. That is where you're really gonna get honest answers about how it happened. And I can tell you, if it's work-related, the hospital is going to ask for workers' compensation information because they want to know who's paying them. So they are going to document very carefully, whether it's workers' comp, private insurance, or some other form of payment. <coughs> Excuse me. So those records are so important to look at because then you'll get it. We've won cases, COVID case, we just won because the woman said that her husband was a police officer got COVID a week before her, and she got it from him. When she got to court, she changed the story and said, nobody in her house, we actually got her for Freud, nobody in her house had COVID before her, it had to be due to work. So those records are important in the investigation. Get the investigator out to the scene, and in addition, make sure you get the initial hospital records. 
And certainly this all must be done before they obtain a lawyer because a lawyer will script everything for them and tell them what to say to have the best chance of them recovering. Hi, Next slide, please. Mike, I just ahead, have a Kim. question. With regards to if they were looking for assistance as far as um, compiling a, a proper policy in place to, as far as enforcing it for the remote workers, where would you, is there any place or where would you recommend them obtaining that information so it's kind of covered from A to Z as far as You mean to put it in place? Yes. A, a, a pre-program? I yeah. would recommend you go to NFP, our office, and there are also vendors out there who can help you with this. So if you want to contact NFP, we work with them. We can get you a vendor who could come. And I mean, I would hire it. I mean, it depends what business you're in, but most businesses don't aren't large enough to have somebody on site to do this. So you can actually hire vendors who will go out and map the work site, but you could also work with NFP and us to give you set up a program. We have done it with um, a lot of employers. And also there are other vendors out there that do it also. And if there's no other question at this moment, next slide, Jeff. Generally, the Workers' Compensation Board will allow workers' compensation benefits to be paid for injuries sustained during minor deviations from work. So we had talked about this already, that just like at work, if you grab a sandwich, and it has to be on a paid lunch break. If it's an unpaid lunch break and somebody leaves your premises and gets hurt, that is not compensable. But if they eat during a paid lunch break on your premises, then it is compensable. It's the same for home. If they're clocked out and they're eating a sandwich in their kitchen, which isn't their work environment, that's not a compensable accident and should be ruled out. But if they get up from their desk to go to the bathroom during their workday, that is compensable. Next slide, please. If the remote worker lives in another state where the company is located, each state has different rules on whether it will accept jurisdiction of the claim. It is important to know the rules for jurisdiction for each state that you have for remote workers. It is important that the employers keep their brokers informed of the remote workers' locations in order to ensure proper workers' compensation coverage. I can't stress enough how important this is, that you talk to your brokers and make sure that you have the proper coverage in place. Because with remote workers, if you're, you know, if you're a national company and you're covered nationally, it's fine. And if you're a huge company and you have coverage in all the states where you're working, but for smaller companies, you may not realize if you're located in New York, that if you have somebody working in California, that you could be subject to a California claim. We've handled many claims that have been disasters for companies. Just handled a couple of weeks ago, a construction company in New Jersey. They had a policy in Jersey, but it was similar to our state fund. State funds, the biggest insurer in the state, and the majority of their policies, if not all, do not have an all states endorsement. They just cover accidents in New York, not outside of New York. Now, if somebody's working in New York and they travel to California and get hurt, New York will take jurisdiction over that claim and you'll be covered because you have coverage in New York. But I do know that if somebody's working in California but comes to New York and get hurt in New York, New York will take jurisdiction of that. If that company doesn't have New York coverage, that'll be an uninsured claim. The penalties for uninsured claims are very high and you might end up covering the cost of the claim, surgeries, lost time, everything. The claim I was just referring to, construction company in New Jersey, they didn't realize that they sent the worker to New York to pick up some supplies. While doing so, that worker was injured. They found out too late that they didn't have an all states endorsement and that their policy only covered New Jersey. New York accepted jurisdiction because the worker was hurt in New York. The worker pursued New York benefits because in his case, he could get paid more in New York, and the employer was uninsured in New York. So with the advent of remote workers possibly working all over the place, possibly working in a state that you don't have coverage in, please speak to your brokers at NFP. Please make sure that they work with you to get the proper coverage. That could be a disastrous event, one that possibly could take a small business under. So that's something to pay very careful attention to. Next slide, Jeff. 
Most states have very specific rules for the time frame that an injured worker must notify their employer of a workplace injury. In New York, a lot of our clients say that an injury must be reported in 24 hours. If it's not, that could be a red flag, but the state provides 30 days. So if they don't comply with your notice requirement, it's a red flag, but it does not prevent them from filing the claim. Very important to note, especially with the remote worker, if notice is not given within 30 days, we have to establish that. Once we establish that, the burden is on the injured worker, which is very important. The burden's on them to prove that the employer has not been prejudiced. If we can prove we have been prejudiced, that claim gets disallowed. And with a remote worker claim, it's not simplistic, but we could definitely prove that late notice has burdened us because we could have gotten an investigator over to the premises to do a quick investigation, which could have told us whether or not it was compensable. Maybe um, your software that tracks whether they are on their computer doesn't, you know, it, it, every 30 days it like records over itself and you lose that information. But if they don't give notice in 30 days, it's important to tell your insurance carrier or TPA that so they could tell defense counsel so we can argue prejudice and try to have that claim disallowed. Next screen, please. Okay, that, that's the end of um, the presentation on remote workers. And now I'm gonna provide you with some information on defending COVID-19 claims. And this is important because thank God, our incidence of COVID claims has decreased greatly. Um, back in 2020, the beginning of 2021, I could tell you we were getting in hundreds of claims for COVID-19. The incidence is way down, thank God, because it means people are safe and that's a good thing, but there could be a spike. So you should know how to defend your workers' compensation claim. So for an occupational disease to be compensable, the employment must be the hazard, not a co-employee or customer. That's important for any occupational disease. Next slide, please. So getting, getting the flu, and as you notice, there are no flu claims unless you're a doctor and you treat flu patients. If you're in the retail business and you don't treat people who are sick with the flu, your job is not a hazard. It would be exposure to a customer for a coworker, and traditionally that was not compensable. Now, due to the fact that COVID-19 affected so many people, just like September 11, 2001 affected so many people, out of compassion to people, the Workers' Compensation Board tried to cover as many claims as possible. That's no different with COVID. Out of compassion for the workforce, they tried to bend the law into a pretzel to cover as many claims. And, and why that's understandable, if they didn't get COVID at their employment, you should not be responsible for that claim. So the job is supposed to be the hazard, such as an asbestos worker working with asbestos. All asbestos workers are subject to getting asbestosis. All people who type on keyboards are subject to getting carpal tunnel syndrome. But all people who work on keyboards are not subject to getting COVID because it hasn't, it's not a hazard of their employment, so it would have to be a hazard. But the board did change the law a little bit to try to include more. So the matter of Goldberg establishes the definition of an occupational disease as one which results from the nature of employment, conditions to which all employees of a class are subject. If a worker contracts a disease such as COVID-19, or as in the past, tuberculosis, it's important to know from whom they contracted the disease. Now, in the matter of Pater, that's 50 years old, but it's still good case law. And what happened in Pater was there was a, a um, person who worked in the jail, and he worked with the inmates. And he was part of the sheriff's department. And he worked with an inmate who had tuberculosis. So in, in that case, it was treated as an accident because tuberculosis wasn't that widespread outside of the jail, but he was subject to exposure to tuberculosis every day. So the prevalence was that he got it from, from the jail. But that's not so true with the workforce, um, especially with the pandemic, because you could have got COVID, it was everywhere. So how could you say it was more prevalent, you got it at work, than anywhere else where, where it was everywhere. 
Next slide, please. The board uses the case of Middleton to circumvent the occupational disease standard for compensability. And this is the case where they established prevalence and that, you know, if you are subject to exposure to tuberculosis at the job, and it's more prevalent, you got it at the job elsewhere. Now I can tell you, we've won a good bit of COVID cases. Anybody who tells you that they won the majority of their COVID cases is misleading you. We lost the majority of our COVID cases because of the widespread compassion the board was leaning towards establishing. So how do you win a COVID case? There's two ways to win it. You either have to prove that they got it from somewhere else, or you have to prove absolutely that there was no exposure at work. I'll give you two examples. One example was the school district we represented, and the teachers were working remotely, the students were remotely, and the administration building was manned by two people. One of the people got COVID. What we proved was that one, the administration building only had two people in it. It was cleansed, cleaned every single night. And in addition, the other person, the only other person, the person who got COVID from came in contact with, never got it and was tested weekly in order to come to work. So we had an airtight case that there was no exposure at work and we won that case. Another one we proved is the one case I talked about earlier today. The one where the woman came and testified under oath that nobody in her house had COVID and she had to get it at work, even though she couldn't even tell us anybody at work who had COVID as she was exposed to, but she had to get it at work because she only went from her home to work. We got the hospital records. We found her, our husband was a police officer. We were able to find out that he had COVID a week before her because when she went to the hospital and she was sick, that's when you get the most truthful statements, as I said before. But those hospital records, we won that case. We had a case that we lost. A person worked in Queens and he walked to work five blocks every day in an area of Queens at that time was a hotbed of COVID. So he's walking down the street next to hundreds of people because it's a very highly populated area, which is a hotbed of COVID. And when he got to work, there were two other people who had COVID besides him. One who worked in a big building, worked on the other side of the building he had no contact with, we proved that. Two was someone he could have come across but got COVID at the same time as him. So we don't know who gave it to who if they did. So there was really no prevalence at work as opposed to him walking to work, but yet because he might've been exposed to one person at work, the board found that compensable. We appealed and they affirmed. So. To win a COVID case, you either better prove that they definitely had exposure elsewhere, like by a hospital record, or that there was no exposure to work. I thought I saw a question. Gail, is there a question? No, I responded to that. Thank you so much, Mike. Okay. I want to leave some time for questions, so we'll go to the next slide, and I will um, try to wrap this up so we can take some questions. Jeff, the next slide. Jeff? Mike, I did. I moved to the next slide. You see? Okay, it? great. Sorry, I didn't see that. You're too quick for me. <laughs> the board uses a theory of prevalence to judge the compensability of COVID-19 claims. Prevalence is determined by looking at the number of people with the condition and the total population of a facility where the employee work. So if you have 300 people at a facility with two people have COVID, you would think that the board would find there was no prevalence since such a limited amount of people had COVID. But I could tell you if there's exposure to one person, the board's been holding it in. Again, they're, they're very compassionate to these workers. They've bent the law into a pretzel to try to lean towards establishing these claims for them. Employers must develop if exposure to COVID was more likely to be exposed to work or outside work. It's important to obtain information about employees' family situation. What activities was the employee engaged in during the two weeks prior to the contraction? Couple of recommendations. What we do is a medical canvas. Find out who's living in the house, because they're going to say after they talk to the lawyer but that nobody in their house had COVID. We won a case by doing a medical canvas. We learned that the person lived with her husband and two sons. We did a medical canvas, even though she testified none of them got COVID. We found out who they would, you could find out who they're treating with. We subpoenaed the son's um, treating doctor's records. 
we actually were able to establish that one of the sons had COVID before the mother, and we were able to succeed in that case. So a medical canvas is also good. Another thing we did to think out of the box, we subpoenaed their cell phone records, debit card records, and credit card records. Those tell you exactly where people go, because if you purchase something, it'll show up on a debit card or a credit card if they don't use cash. And a cell phone, every time you make a call, identifies on the bill where the call was made from or where the call was received. So in cases that, you know, with a case where they had two weeks lost time, they were back to work, they treated a little bit and the cost was low, we did not go to these great extents. In a death case, we did. In a case where they're still out of work six months later and the hospital bills were astronomical, we went through these extents to see if it was a compensable claim. Not trying to deny a compensable claim, we just don't want to pay for a claim that's not our responsibility. So those are all the technique, techniques you can use to try to defend against COVID claims. Jeff? Investigations that involve the claimant's activities and exposures outside of work. Employers must document whether any exposures occurred at work and New York has not passed any new legislation covering COVID-19 claims. Other states, especially the companies on, uh, on the presentation listening to it, other states did. I know California did and some other states that made almost all COVID claims compensable. New York did not, but then they didn't have to because like I said, they bent the law into a pretzel to try to cover as many claims as possible. So without changing the law, they were able to change the law um, effectively. I believe that is the last slide. That is, that is correct, Mike. Okay, so um, just at this moment in time, uh, before we opened up the questions, again, on behalf of Vecchione, Vecchione, Connors, and Kano, I would like to thank all of you um, for listening into the presentation. Certainly help you found it helpful. My email is mvecchione at vecchionelaw.com. If you have any questions as a courtesy, we would be more than happy to answer them for you. Again, I want to thank the nice people at NFP for hosting uh, this seminar, putting it on, and for setting it up and doing all the artwork. I appreciate it, and um, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and if any of the participants have any uh, other questions right now, uh, feel free to submit them and we can answer them. If not, uh, you, Mike provided his uh, email address. I'll provide mine and Gail's as well. Again, my name is Jeff Stagg at NFP. So that's jeff.stagg at nfp.com. And Gail Hamilton is gail.hamilton at nfp.com. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. We are available to you and we're always here to help. And Mike, thank you very much for all your time and effort. With My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Very, everybody, very much appreciated. Everybody have a wonderful day. And I will turn it back over to Amber. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. To reiterate, we recorded today's presentation and the recording will be available in Academy within two business days. Finally, at this time, I'd like to take a moment to ask you to take a short survey today. The survey will populate in a new window when you exit out of Zoom. Please take a brief moment to complete the survey as it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps make our education program as current and relevant as possible. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.